Thank you, uh, everyone, for uh, joining uh, this meeting. I'm Jan Tjallik van der Wal, I work at Imaris, and I'll be presenting on a oil spill leak challenge that we have done for the uh, North Sea Checkpoint project. So, I will be discussing uh, a bit about the Checkpoint project, what the partners are, what the aims are, and what there are a series of challenges within that project. Um, the main one to, I will be presenting here will be the oil spill leak challenge, and we'll, I'll give some attention to the tools that, and the data that we selected to uh, face that challenge, and with some particular focus on the Copernicus data that we have been using. I will be presenting in brief, briefly some of the results of both a rehearsal of the challenge itself, uh, which was at the South Arne platform in Danish waters, and the challenge itself, what happens, which was kicked off just a few weeks ago in the Brent Delta platform, somewhere rather far up north in the North Sea. Um, I will present you a bit about downloading and preparing the data sets because it wasn't all completely ready for use, and I'll spend some attention on the advantages of using the Copernicus derived data sets. So, the North Sea Checkpoint project is part of the Growth and, Eco in growth and Innovation in, in Ocean Economy uh, program from uh, DG Mare, the Director General for uh, Maritime Affairs and Fisheries, and it's about gaps and priorities in sea basin observation and data. The project partners are HR Wallingford um, and McAllister Elliott and Partners and DG Mare's. HR Wallingford is um, hydraulic research company uh, in, uh, in England, uh, based in Wallingford, obviously. Um, McAllister Ellington Partners is a fisheries consultancy company based in Southampton, also in England. And then Imaris is, the, is a Dutch institute, we are an applied research institute, non, not for profit. And, uh, it's an acronym for the Institute for Marine Resources and Ecosystem Studies, and we are part of the uh, Wageningen U University and Research Centres, and then we are one of those research centres. The geographical scope of the project is uh, the wider North Sea, including the uh, Skarkrak and Kattegat area, but also a large part of the English Channel. Um, the objective is that we test the marine observation infrastructure for cost effectiveness, reliability and utility and the North Sea was lot one of the, this project because there are a, f a lot more. There is the Mediterranean um, lot that was kicked off at the same time as the North Sea in 2013 and last year four more. Checkpoint projects were launched by DG Mara for the Baltic, the Black Sea, the Northwest Atlantic, and the Arctic Ocean. So, um, and you can find all of these at the emotnet.eu, yeah, emotnet uh, and then there is a sea basin checkpoints menu choice, and then you can go to either of them. So. DGMR is hoping for, to get a view of synergies that, in, that might be uh, available if they combine uh, observation data collection programs. They want to check whether they meet the needs of uh, users, uh, whether there are gaps, uh, stuff that we need, we need to face any of those challenges and what can be done to fill those, whether new technologies might be available that can make things happen faster, easier, or more accurate, or whether we need better uh, temporal or spatial resolution in the data sets. So there are, a there's a long series of uh, work packages uh, in each of these projects, um, and as you can tell from the screenshots, uh, a web having a website is part of that. Um, there's a wind farm sighting uh, challenge, marine protected areas, climate and coastal protection, fisheries management, marine environment and river inputs, and last but not least uh, for this presentation, oil platform leaks. So 
to face that challenge, we had to find a model that could actually predict the trajectory that an oil spill would take. We had a preconceived idea of how we could face that challenge, but um, DG Mara, unfortunately for us, took quite a while to actually ground the project. So by the time we got the project, the initial plan was thwarted. We couldn't afford to use that anymore. So we came up with a solution to use NOM, the, which is from NOAA, and it's an acronym for, I need to look that one up. It's the General NOAA Operational Modeling Environment. It is available uh, free of charge. You can find it at the NOAA website. Um, we needed quite a bit of data to uh, face the challenge. Uh, much of what we needed and we were able to source from uh, EMOTnet, but the European Environmental Agency has uh, a very valuable uh, data set also uh, on the Natura 2000 areas, but there's also many other sources for instance, Norway is bordering the North Sea as well, but they do not have, they are not part of the European Union, so at the EEA and the EMONET, you don't find all that you would need or want from Norway, but they have a lot of data available as well. So, and then from Copernicus, we used mainly wind and currents. Uh, more on that uh, later. Ah. Now, the, now it's showing the pictures. That's when these are the cards from the catalog. So for the South Arna platform, we got a rehearsal somewhere in 2014. We had about a half a year to get prepared. And it was uh, one of the things that we had um, <coughs> included in the project proposal to have a rehearsal to check for ourselves whether we were sufficiently prepared to face the challenge because once uh, we were informed that um, terrorists had taken over uh, the South Arna platform and were di diverting to production into the sea, we had 24 hours to come up with an initial assessment for what's going to happen, where, where is this oil going to end up, what kind of assets are under threat, and then we have another 48 hours, so total duration of 72 hours to come up for the refined assessment. So this is a picture of what one of the outputs that we uh, created. You can see the black dots um, with about 24 hours apart in the simulation where they all ended up. There are red dots around which are not the best guess or the expected trajectory but where uh, but a no regret option that norm has where you might that might end up so there's a small risk that all could get there uh, you see the green areas which are the two of the thousand uh, areas so there is some something we're protecting there we, we had a look at what it was um, the yellow and orange colors are shipping activity um, so the oil does not reach beaches, at, not, at least not um, according to the best guess scenario. There is a slight risk of contamination on the, on the Danish coast, like here, here to Boyern. Um, there is some risk to some of the other oil, uh, oil infrastructure, which are the yellow dots, like uh, Siri and Nini platforms, uh, and there's shipping lanes that are uh, being crossed by this uh, area. But there is no major specific risk to biology. There were no fish spawning in the area. There are no large congregations of harbor porpoises or the sea mammals in the area at, at that time. So the Grand Delta was kicked off uh, as the two challenges. Uh, well, uh, Tuesday, uh, 10th of uh, May, just a couple of weeks ago. And in this hypothetical scenario, the Brent Delta platform is uh, being prepared for decommissioning, which it is truly is. It's already been shut down, and they were doing work there, and something went wrong, and about 5,000 cubic meters of crude oil would be leaking into the uh, sea uh, in this scenario uh, from a depth of 229 feet into the water column, 
and they were expecting the leak to be sealed after 48 hours. Um, what we did for this, before we did the 72 hours uh, simulation for the final report, is we got back to the um, email secretariat, which were being the director of the, the whole exercise, to confirm whether the 48 hour repair ha had been successful or not, or whether we needed to extend the leak period or whatever, but they told us no, everything went fine, went as expected, so it was sealed after 48 hours in our simulation. And then uh, this is uh, what we got in increasingly darker colors in the final one. Uh, a light outline is where the oil ends up in about five days of simulation. From, uh, from the start of the incident, the red dots are, again, the, the no regret options which shows you that there is a slight risk the, these crosses are beached oil here on the Norwegian coast possibly also get on the Shetlands where there are marine protected areas um, we were missing some, protect, uh, some uh, protected areas in, in Norway but we looked them up uh, during the exercise but we know they are there but we didn't find them in something that was readily available, so readily available that we could put it on the map uh, within the time from stage where we were having. There's also oil infrastructure uh, there. There is shipping of course, but um, it's that far up north that the map that we showed before, how can I go back? Not like that. This colorful map with the orange and yellows it stops just south of where we are with the Brent Delta. So, too bad. We also did uh, an additional uh, confirmation of the fate of the oil. The, that graph on the top shows uh, the fate of the oil, whether it's still on the water or evaporated. Evaporated is the blue, the green is uh, floating on the water. There's a bit, might be submerged according to another model from uh, NOAA, uh, no, uh, Adios, uh, the, 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 the split between what is floating and what is, has evaporated is very close also to what the NOAA model it itself uh, calculated. So, to download the data sets we used the Python client that is available from uh, CMEM, uh, CMEMS. CMEMS. Let's go with that one. Um, and it helped us to ensure that we repeatedly could download the same data set uh, also at a later date. Um, we made a command line uh, file, a command file to program it so that we could reuse it and make it easy. Um, we did use the interactive catalog quite a bit to download, uh, especially during the phase that we were preparing for, to get prepared for the challenge. But we also uh, used it uh, on occasion when um, Copernicus informed us that data sets or delivery things, there, there would be slight changes. So then we, we, we download something from, from the catalog, check whether it was usable whether we need to adjust some stuff or not and uh, we didn't run into major problems there. So um, the data sets did need some preparing, uh, for instance um, we found it was useful to improve our uh, simulation to interpolate the wind so that we get wind data closer into shore otherwise no one would just forget about wind like 20 miles offshore and never reach them reach the coast. Um, also, the wind data set from Copernicus does not have, uh, or did not have at the time, um, forecasted winds, so we found a, di uh, a different source, globalmarine.net.com, uh, um, that has an email service that emails us every day a, a new, fresh five-day forecast, which also means that we have the forecast of yesterday to fill in the gap between the near real-time data sets that we use for Copernicus and the five-day forecast. 
um, that comes as a grip file listed. So we need to do a version there. Gnome has fixed expectations about how the variables are named in the NetCDF that it wants to read. So we used an, an R script, which is part of that, um, to link the, for, the, the near real time and the reprocessed data with the forecast, do the interpolation, and prepare them the, the variable names so it would all fit into uh, no. The currents were easier because the current data set already has a forecast. So, with Copernicus, we were able to uh, not need a hydrographical circulation model uh, to get the currents right, and uh, not that we didn't have a, uh, the need to have a meteorological atmospherical model uh, to do that. Um, it unfortunately has no forecast for the wind, but we were able to find a different source for that, and we were able to blend the, the two sources together. We found that over the period, the two years that we have kept our readiness for the challenge uh, up to speed, that uh, generally speaking, it's a, a stable and reliable method of uh, delivering the data, and also the, the, the file format, the NetCDF, is very stable. We did not need to do much in way of um, adjusting the download script or uh, adjusting the R script to be able to keep on using the data. So that was, that was very convenient, and um, I think that's pretty much all I have to say for the time being. Any questions or uh, remarks?